Hey students, this is Professor Gore, and this is part two of the Capitalism and Labor recorded lecture. And so in the first part, kind of introduced the kind of tremendous economic growth that took place after the panic of uh, 1873 and the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. So really, American capitalism is one of the kind of creates this environment. There's several factors that creates this environment for such a tremendous amount of economic growth. One, the United States is blessed with lots of natural resources geographically, like coal, iron ore, uh, navigable rivers, coastline, uh, copper, uh, silver, gold, many other minerals and so forth. Also, a lot of petroleum, like at one point, Ohio was the Saudi Arabia of the world, which is why Cleveland was a big oil town for a long time in American history. Um, and that's where John D. Rockefeller lived. You also had... Um, the demand for jobs created by this massive amounts of immigration that's going to uh, take place. And we'll cover that in the growth of cities uh, recorded lecture, but incredible amounts of that. Plus you had a government that was more laissez faire or really laissez faire at this time and allowed um, this free enterprise to take place. Now there are going to be some abuses and so forth. And so there's going to be some regulation, that comes about uh, during the progressive era, uh, starting with, with uh, my favorite president, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he's my favorite president for many reasons. But um, but you see this happening. Uh, I want to just kind of emphasize that there is an environment perfect for this type of economic growth. Uh, the demand is there. Um, the labor is there. The natural resources are there. The entrepreneurship is there and particularly the wealth um, to be able to start these types of enterprises and investments. Um, they're going to uh, come into these factories that allows this this uh, tremendous period of economic growth to take off. Now, one of the, another uh, captain of industry uh, for the meatpacking industry I like to talk about is Gustavus Swift, um, and he had uh, opening up a Union stockyards in 1865 in Chicago, and Chicago became the cattle market for the country. That's where a lot of cattle were shipped to be slaughtered. And then they would be uh, cut up and packaged and sent on refrigerated rail cars uh, to various cities in the U.S. Originally, it was Cincinnati, but Gustavus Swift uh, makes it so much more with um, cattle industry. And Cincinnati was more uh, pork and so forth. Um, so he, defeated, he developed a refrigerated rail cars. This is another innovation that also allows this environment for capitalism uh, and tremendous economic growth. And so you can't can't understate the importance of the United States being an innovative nation at this time. So he did use vertical integration, much like um, um, Andrew Carnegie did, and could control about 90 percent of the meat shipped in interstate commerce. So through vertical integration, he is in, end up going to establish a lot of horizontal integration by almost having a, a monopoly by controlling 90 percent of the market. Um, he put a lot of smaller competitors out of business by ruthlessly cutting prices. Okay, you'll see this happen throughout this time period in American history. And here's Gustav Swift, who actually was an immigrant. And so um, one of the things that he decided was he was going to have the, the cattle uh, slaughtered in Chicago to prevent the cattle from losing weight in transit. In order to do this, he had to have engineers come up with refrigerated rail cars, which he was able to. Um, he also constructed facilities to process the fertilizer, chemicals, and other usable byproducts from the slaughter of cattle. He eventually expanded to Kansas City, Fort Worth, and Omaha. Um, he, he, uh, I mentioned he used vertical integration, which is important. And he and many other corporations of business were able to put out smaller competitors by using market control which, uh, and greater efficiency, which market control is like ruthlessly uh, cutting the prices to eventually put somebody under and then you raise your prices. Now let's go to the uh, most well-known captain of industry. And if he wasn't the wealthiest guy in world history, he certainly was number two. Um, and and only person, like I said, uh, that could rival Rockefeller is, is Mansa Musa of West Africa, um, back during period three of world history. But basically when Rockefeller came on the scene, the petroleum business was was really non-existent other than, than kerosene from well fat. Uh, but what happens is Edwin L. Drake, drilled about 70 feet below ground in Pennsylvania and found crude oil. Now, it's interesting because you can drill all day long, but if you don't find a use and find a way to refine that crude oil, then you've got a worthless product. Um, and so what Rockefeller did 
um, is he broke into the petroleum business with Standard Oil of Ohio after the war. Now, what he did is he didn't get into drilling the oil. He got into refining it because in order for crude oil to be worth something, it has to be refined. OK, and, and at that time when they refined crude oil, it made two different products. One was slow burning clear liquid called kerosene. The other one was a highly volatile, quick burning uh, clear liquid called gasoline. And so interesting enough, gasoline is going to be used in internal combustion engines. Um, and so one of the things that Rockefeller did is he took advantage of, re of rebates from the railroad companies. Uh, Rockefeller put uh, out many of his competitors, especially in Ohio, just out of business. And by the early 1880s, Standard Oil controlled 95 of 95 percent of the nation's refining capacity. Rockefeller used vertical integration by adding a vast distribution network, particularly oil pipelines and tankers uh, and big stake in oil fields where they drilled. Now, he didn't always own them, but he owned portions of them with investments. OK, so um, he was worth an incredible amount of money. And um, so Rockefeller um, is going to do very well and be the wealthiest guy of U.S. history. In fact, his children, his descendants are still living off of his money. Uh, through investments and uh, other business enterprises they've got involved in. Now, one of the things he did, this is a great political cartel on the left, by the way, it shows him controlling the railroads, is particularly he approached Vanderbilt's railroad, among others, and said, look, I want a rebate if I'm going to ship my petroleum products on your rail line. They're like, what are you talking about? Well, because he was able to guarantee certain amount of barrels of oil on their rail line every week. So that's guaranteed transportation profits right there. He expected a rebate back. So what he did is he kind of squeezed the transportation issue be, being the railroads to, to lower their profit margins on his shipping. But he increased their overall revenue because he shipped so much oil on their rail line. Okay. So it's kind of like, um, well, I don't know if I want to make a connection to, to Walmart, but, you know, Walmart is usually the biggest uh, seller for, for particular products. That's why so many companies try to get in their product into Walmart because you have so many more consumers that are able to purchase your products. And it does very well for the, uh, the products that are able to get into Walmart um, and so forth. So his critics called him Rockefeller or Rockefeller. And uh, one of his quotes was pay no man a profit. So he'd always try to squeeze the middleman cost. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, different things Robert Barron's did at this time that uh, uh, later is going to be outlawed um, is these rebates. Okay. So like, Hey, bigger um, ship, bigger companies could get a greater, could get a rebate while smaller companies couldn't. So therefore it would, they would, wouldn't be able to offer as low of prices. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's going to fix that with the, uh, uh, later with the Elkins Act and so forth in the early 20th century. Um, you also have kickbacks um, where like, hey, if I'm going to do this, you're going to kick back some money to me. Uh, buyouts where you basically, uh, Rockefeller would slash his prices, eventually buy out his competition, which they couldn't take it anymore. And um, Congress was at this time appointed by um well, I should say the Senate, the House of Representatives was properly elected by the people, but the Senate was picked by the state legislatures. And so um, oftentimes kind of these big monopolies or trusts um, could kind of pay the state legislatures to allow certain individuals that were um, favorable to them to serve in the U.S. Senate. Uh, later, the uh, 17th Amendment is going to prevent that and, and senators are directly elected by the people. Um, also spying and so forth. These are business practices that are illegal today. This is a political cartoon of Rockefeller controlling the White House. And also all of his barrels of oil with the Capitol building in the back. Here's another one, Standard Oil, like an octopus, taking over Washington, the Capitol, and, and heading to the White House. Here's another political cartoon. This is fascinating. And so you see the monopoly entrance and you see all these monopolists coming in They're They're like big money bags and it's got each of the trust name on it. And then up in the top left, you see people's entrance. It's closed. 
And so the um, congressmen are, are kind of controlled by these big monopoly money bags, according to this political cartoon. So this is an anti-monopoly political cartoon. So you can see the biased and point of view there. Here's another one. Um, it's trying to make a connection to the old medieval time where the nobles or barons uh, took taxes from the commoners. And now they're saying that the um, uh, big monopoly and barons or so forth are doing that from the common work farmers today, or at least in that day and age. Now, one of the things that was used to justify um, this tremendous amount of economic growth um, and then wealth creation, like why were certain individuals becoming so ridiculously wealthy and, and, and many were not. All right. Well, in 1857, Charles Darwin uh, published uh, his famous work called On the Origin of Species. Now, it's got a longer title than that, but uh, that's the, the main title. And in that uh, work, um, he theorized that um, basically species evolve over time. And one of the things he advocated for was that some species survive, while others do not, because it's survival of the fittest, those that can adapt to the climate change and so forth. And so um, he advocated um, both micro and macro evolution. Now, uh, in the late 1800s, a British economist by the name of Herbert Spencer had was influenced by Charles Darwin, who was also British, and um, read his his work and saw hmm, this could be applied to society, and it developed into social Darwinism. Okay, in social Darwinism, it was thought that those that were wealthy were smarter, um, were the fittest of society. That's why they did better, hard work, the hardest working, and so forth. Those that were middle class were a little bit lesser, but for more advanced than the lower class. And so it was theorized by Herbert Spencer that those that were poor were poor because they were the weakest. They were not the smartest. They were not the hardest working. They did not have the drive and ambition and so forth to be successful. Now, there's a lot of factors that go into some person's success. And so this gets disproven later uh, in history, particularly with uh, the Nazi Third Reich. They, they, they use kind of science to justify this Aryan race and, and whatnot. Okay. Um, so social Darwinism um, was used to um, defend this wealth. Okay. Um, so this is from Rockefeller after reading about social Darwin it says belief in the co economic world, the strongest companies will survive. The growth of a large business is merely survival of the fittest. Um, so anyway, com companies that struggled to survive just weren't the fittest. It was just like in they viewed it just like in, at Darwin theorized in nature that uh, those species didn't survive because they were the weakest. OK, um, that's not really always the case. So. That's social Darwinism. Now, one good thing that comes out of this time is philanthropy. Now, philanthropy is a big deal um, all the way to, to today. Uh, but philanthropy is where you have wealthy people or wealthy corporations, and this still happens all across the country today. In fact, statistically speaking, at the time of this lecture, the United States was or is the most um, philanthropic or, or giving and charitable nation in the world. Uh, more Americans give a greater percentage of their wealth to charities and, and nonprofits than any other nation in the world, and that is pretty cool. Um, so anyway, but philanthropy, um, it's, it's basically where you're – giving your money for charitable causes. Um, so maybe founding of a university, founding, uh, giving money to cancer research, um, giving money to college scholarships for low income kids, um, various varieties of things of uh, philanthropy. You could um, give philanthropy to a, a battered woman shelter or to homeless shelter or to, um, uh, you know, an animal shelter, whatever it may be. Okay. Now, so Carnegie, of all the uh, captains of industry, he and Rockefeller gave away the most. Now, the reason why Rockefeller kind of won up to Carnegie was because Rockefeller made more money. But, um, uh, but Carnegie really was one of the earliest philanthropists, um, gave millions to colleges and libraries. And a lot of libraries across the Midwest and the Northeast were, were built because of Carnegie. Now, the reason why he was able to do this is he sold Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan's uh, investment banking firm, and they created U.S. Steel, and he made millions upon millions of millions of dollars 
with that sale. And so he had more money than he needed. So against his children's wishes, he gave away most of his wealth. And so um, when we get to the labor part of this lecture, I'll talk about the homestead strike in which that along with the Johnstown flood uh, is one of the reasons why Carnegie became a philanthropist is he wanted to repair his, his uh, image that would have been badly damaged in the public's eye because of the homestead strike and uh, the Johnstown flood. Now, um, one of the things that, that uh, Carnegie wrote in 1889, he wrote this book called The Gospel of Wealth, or pamphlet, so to speak. And he, he says this, the man who dies leaving behind him millions of able wealth, which was to his minister during life, will pass away unwept, unhonored, and unsung. No matter to what uses he leaves the dross, which he cannot take with him. Uh, of such as these, the public verdict will then be the man dies, rich dies, disgraced. Now, I had a uh, somebody that... Um, older guy that was friends with my parents uh, used to say, um, you know, people that are trying to just hoard wealth um, are, you know, trying to get all they can, can all they get, sit on the can. Um, of course, he also used to say, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul either, talking about you can't take it with you. So Carnegie lived by that and gave most of his wealth away. Now, it is children did inherit some, but he gave away a lot of it. Now, Carnegie was a big fan of social Darwinism. Um, also, was what you would classify as uh, racist because but really one of the, one of the negative effects of Darwin's theory of uh, on the origin of species and and, and particularly macroevolution was that it was commonly thought among particularly the British and the French and the Germans uh, among the more advanced industrialized nations of the world and they were Americans they were in elite positions that thought this as well now we didn't have it as widely thought across the U.S. as some of the other countries France, but it was thought that the Anglo-Saxon race was superior. Now, one of the reasons why the United States doesn't quite do that, because think about all the immigration we had uh, and the diversity. But um, Carnegie was one that an American um, that thought that the Anglo-Saxon race was superior. So it was the wealthiest job, and particularly the Anglo-Saxon race, to take care of those that are downtrodden and poor. It's your job to help out those that are less fortunate. And so, for instance, one of the things that uh, to advance science, um, also one of the things going to be used to justify European imperialism is this idea that 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 uh, their race is superior to others. And so therefore, it's their job to civilize and bring medicine and religion to these uh, areas of Africa and, and South Asia and Southeast Asia and so forth. Um, Rockefeller gave away a ton of money to hospitals and colleges. So Carnegie did it more for uh, libraries and colleges. In fact, um, I had a friend of mine um, years ago that went to Carnegie Mellon um, in Pittsburgh, a famous engineering school, and he was a civil engineering uh, major there. Um, Rockefeller gave money to University of Chicago, which is an elite tier one institution, Spelman College, gave a bunch of money to national parks, was part of the conservation movement. Um, he gave money to the founding of the United Nations, or really the Rockefeller Foundation did. Uh, also, Colonial Williamsburg, which is a really cool place I've gone to as a kid that's kind of had the colonial life preserved. Uh, you could go tour it as like a uh, reenactment and so forth, and then cancer research. Vanderbilt gave about a million dollars to Vanderbilt University. You also had uh, James Buchanan Duke, who uh, made his money in the rolled cigarettes manufacturing business. Okay, and hired particularly young single women because he could pay them less, but he gave money to the founding of Duke University. Uh, Leland Stanford, famous, uh, the most famous California railroad builder, he gave, his, gave money to build Stanford University. So some of the elite um, academic institutions in our country that weren't Ivy League, a lot of them are, some of them are going to be founded by philanthropy. All right, let's talk about consumer marketing. With all these products available, uh, the rush to advertise their products began, and we see this so played out today, whether it be advertisements on social media, on TV, on billboards, um, it, you know, you even see it at, at sports stadiums. I mean, we're advertised to death now, but it all begins here. For rural consumers, Montgomery Ward and Sears and Roebuck developed huge mail order enterprises. Now, we don't see as much mail order catalog stuff, my mom still does it, but a lot of people still don't. They typically shop online or in the store. But uh, this led to a nationwide consumer market. And the city's department stores dominated 
John Wanamaker began the practice in 1875 in Philadelphia while the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, which is called AMP, and F.W. Woolworth opened up a chain of stores. So AMP and F.W. Woolworth were some of the earliest uh, department stores. Americans were ready-made consumers of standardized mass marketed goods. Their geographic mobility tended to erase the preference for local products that shape uh, European taste. Dressed by social class fade away some during this time because of all the standardization. Many resisted and supported local businesses. Nevertheless, modern advertising was born in the late 19th century, bringing brand names and billboard cluttered urban landscape. And by 1900, companies were spending over $90 million a year for the space in newspapers and magazines. And more money is spent on that on just a 30 or 60 second commercial during the Super Bowl now. What's interesting how Sears and Robot got started, uh, there was a, um, a guy on the railroad um, line who was one of the conductors that uh, uh, would tell the time and, and take people's tickets and so forth. Well, uh, it was important that a railroad employee had a workable watch. And so um, he started getting watches and selling them to other railroad employees. Well, there was such a demand via the telegraph that he ended up uh, kind of opening up a, a store to ship them with these catalogs. And then he expanded his other products from, from uh, pocket watches to a bunch of other things. Now let's look at the managerial revolution. Now, who knows, some of you um, may be in management positions um, or your parents are, or you have uh, relatives or, or neighbors and so forth that are involved in management positions. This is one of the things that's really cool about the, the Gilded Age time period is that this time of, of tremendous economic growth does lead to um, the middle class developing. And one of the ways middle class develop is management positions. So management positions come with more responsibilities, higher pay, more employees under you. And so it's, this is how it leads to the middle class. With the rise of modern day corporation, the rise of the management model began as well. With few exceptions, vertically integrated firms follows a centralized, functionally departmentalized plan with the main office housing top executives and departments covering specific areas of activity. Still that way in business corporations today. So you had a purchasing department, still that way. Auditing, production, transportation, sales, okay? These departments provide for the first time middle management. They directed the flow of goods and information through integrative enterprise, and they were key innovators um, equivalent in matters of business practice to engineers and improving technology. By the turn of the century, 100 largest companies controlled a, roughly a third of the nation's total productive capacity. Small companies and manufacturers still existed, but large scale enterprise would remain the dominant form of industrial organization. Now, this is a, 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 a example of the Ashcan School of Art. That, so you had the Hudson River School that we talked about in U.S. History One to play the painted the beauty of American landscapes. Well, the Ashcan School of Art was kind of the opposite. It played instead of rural, beautiful landscapes. It painted urban, kind of grim landscapes to show you know the bad living conditions in the cities. Um, now, this is from Theodore Roosevelt in the early 1900s. We said the old familiar relations between employer and employee were passing. A few generations before, the boss had known every man in his shop. He called his men by their first names, asked about the family, and swapped jokes and stories with them. Today, you have a large factory. The personal touch is gone. Impersonalization. Now, this is going to set up the, the last part of this lecture, and that is the, the labor movement, which is tremendously important. Um, and so one of the things industrialization is going to lead to both in the first phase, which is the first half of the 1800s and the second phase in the latter half in the early 1900s is poor working conditions. OK, that's going to be something that progressive era is going to be looking to improve in the early 1900s that we cover in a later module, module two on friendliness and impersonalization. OK, so workers are just there. They're easy to replace, uh, especially unskilled workers, immigrants taking jobs. And one of the things that you'll see, the, the biggest anti-immigrant groups in American history at this time are labor unions because they feel threatened by them economically. Um, also, they want less, they want higher pay, yet um, less hours to work in the day, so they can spend more time at home with their family. If they're making more, they don't have to work as much. Machines replacing workers, that's going to be a common thing as industrialization continues. We see that happening in present day. Also, child labor. So many children are employed because they could pay them less and they could fit into machinery to fix things easier. And then um, also industrialization is going to lead to more job security. You don't have to worry about the weather like you do as a farmer. And so industrialization has many pros, many cons. 
Um, just to recap for the pros is industrialization leads to the greatest wealth ever created in world history. It leads to a higher standard of living for um, people that are living in industrialized countries. Um, you have a growth of the middle class. It leads to more consumer products that people can have that make their lives easier and so forth. Uh, eventually, industrialization is going to spark uh, better advancements in medicine uh, and so forth. Um, it also leads to um, uh, greater transportation innovations, among other things. But on the negative side, it's bad conditions for laborers. Um, you also have uh, really nasty urban conditions that because uh, cities develop so rapidly, they don't have time to really plan out things well. Um, also, at times workers being exploited with really crappy pay, especially if they were in unskilled jobs. Now, if you had a skilled job that any old average Joe couldn't do, then you were able to bargain much more uh, collectively for your um um, your wages and so forth, and you had a better, better, um, better pay and, and a little better respect. Those that were did the same old monotonous, unskilled job day in and day out uh, were a lot of times powerless, and that's why they formed labor unions. And we will stop there and get to the labor movement in the last part of this lecture.